Welcome, and welcome to well, I hope will be a little armchair tour of, uh, of the country. I, I want to get stuck straight in, as it were, and to talk, uh, to just mention my first visit to Madagascar was in 2004. And on that occasion, I went for the Daily Telegraph to write an article for their sort of luxury market. And I went to Madagascar and stayed in the loveliest hotels. It was what you might call a fluffy towel uh, tour. But it left me with completely the wrong impression of uh, Madagascar. I, I came back having loved it, but also aware that I hadn't really seen real Madagascar. The other thing is that uh, when we went there, uh, my wife was four months pregnant. And I, I think if I knew now, if I knew then what I now know about Madagascar, there's really no way we would have gone. I think at the time there was only one CT scanner in the whole country, there's no neurosurgeon at that time and so on. So it would have been a quite out of the question. But we did go and there were no uh, antenatal misadventures and it was fine. And it left me with this abiding fascination for the country, but also intrigue. Intrigued by those people with that lovely, sad smile. What was Pinevid? And what was the story of these people? We, we know so much, thanks to Attenboroughs and Durrells and so on, about the animal life of Madagascar, and we were brought up with it. But the people and the history of this country remained something of a mystery. So I decided that uh, some years later I would uh, take the role of a historian in the field, as you like, and travel round the country and try to bolt on history to my travels so people could see as I travelled how the history of this country affected the landscapes and the people and so on, and just bring it to life a little bit with descriptions of what I saw. And so I created uh, this walk-through history. Now, I'm not going to take you through the history of uh, Madagascar. Apart from the else, we'd be here till next Wednesday if I started. But more importantly, because you are a well-read, knowledgeable uh, audience, you probably, many of you, know far more about the history of Madagascar than I do. And therefore, I, uh, I, I'm just going to take you to four particular journeys with a little bit of history uh, added to them. But I do want to give you a little flavour of the challenges that are faced by someone like me who's trying to tell the story. Madagascar is, of course, enormous. Just to remind you, it's a thousand miles from one end to, to another. And just to put that in perspective, if you lay that on a map of Europe, it's the distance between London and Algiers. And somehow you've got to get around this country, which has a, 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 an established road network it is actually shorter than Jamaica's, and we know that Jamaica's like a little, little stop on the, on, the, on the world map. So there it is, really challenging. And that's before the physical challenges of travelling around this country and trying to make sense of it in a historical perspective. There's that lovely quote by E.F. Gautier, the uh, geographer, French geographer in 1900, who said that Madagascar has the form, colour, consistency and fertility of a brick. <laughs> It's, it's not entirely true, but it's a lovely, a, a lovely expression of the, of the sort of raw difficulties you face uh, in this journey. Now, the early uh, Arab travellers to this country called it the Island of the Moon. And that may be because they very often didn't get further than the ports. They set up little Baghdads or entrepots, as it were, along the coast. And from what they could see, it looked like the moon. But I always think that if they'd travelled a little bit further inland, they would have seen something different, something red, something very fecund, something also very green, an amazing wildlife. And that's why I decided that, half tongue in cheek perhaps, that uh, if they'd done that journey inland, they would have called this country the Gardens of Mars. So as part of this journey, I travelled by river. I travelled about 380 kilometres by river. You'll recognise this. It's the uh, Sarabina River. Sarabina river. Uh, lovely journey for those of you who've done it. And also, I travelled parts of the uh, 
Pangolin Canal. And it's a great to think that that canal is eight times the length of the Panama Canal, although, of course, it's not all uh, man-made. Uh, much of it is natural. And I also travelled, of course, uh, by plane. It's difficult to avoid it if you want to, carry the to cover the ground. But in terms of time, most of my time travelling was spent on the road, travelling by taxi, Bruce, and so on. It is, of course, a great way to meet people. Uh, it's not as grim as some writers have uh, said. Minibus Network is great uh, these days. But I did do about 5,500 kilometres by, um, by Taxi Bruce. So, uh, yeah, it's a good, good way of picking us up. I'm not going to tell you about, much though I'd love to, about the forts and the palaces along the way, or the wrestlers and the lemurs and the schooners and the trains. But it won't, because it's a well-known tale to, to many of you. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to four encounters or stories that brought uh, my, my travels and history together, as it were. And the first of these stories uh, really comes from the very, very south coast, very, it's almost the most southerly point of uh, Madagascar. Now, just to set this in the context, until the 17th century, Europeans had made very few inroads into uh, Madagascar in terms of settlement. They'd all tried, the French, the English, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and they all failed, largely due to either disease or due to hostile uh, locals. And, and this tale, to my mind, illustrates some of the difficulties that they faced. And it begins with the wreck of this ship, the De Grave. The De Grave was an East India merchantman. It had gone to India from, from England, picked up a cargo of 50 tonnes of paper and 100 tonnes of saltpetre, set off from uh, India, uh, sprung a leak near Mauritius, tried to repair it, and then the ship was seriously sinking by the time it got to the south coast. They thought they might pull into Fort Dauphin, but it was occupied by pirates at that time, uh, King Abraham Samuel, Samuel Abraham as he was called, and so they decided to sail on. And they foundered uh, pretty close to uh, Cape St. Mary, or Cap St. Marie. So this story has for a long time been thought of as fake, something that Defoe dreamt up. But in fact, and some of you will remember a talk here about five years ago by a professor, from, professor of archaeology from Sheffield who uh, actually managed to establish that actually the story was probably true. And there is a strong correlation between the language used by the author, Robert Drury, and the place names of this place and the historical names of the characters involved. He also uh, found uh, some canon in, in this place, but it's our, and I decided that I'd like to go there. Now, it's quite a struggle. It's two days' journey by, by road out to this area, and then it's a seven-kilometre walk through the dunes with some villagers until you get uh, to this place. And, of course, at each village we stopped, we had to explain what we're doing to the locals. It sometimes took an hour or so. This is not because we hoped that they would know about the De Grave, but it was really to, to ask their consent to be in their area, uh, tramping through it, looking for uh, bits of a shipwreck or some clues or something that happened well over uh, two centuries ago. Anyway, we got to the beach here with my villagers, uh, and this is the sort of place, we don't know exactly where the ship founded, but this is the sort of place where the De Grave founded. And there were 170 survivors, and they encountered on the beach these people. And these are their descendants today, the Antandroi. They are, as many of you will know, a remarkable breed of people. They are tough, resilient. They live with almost perpetual water shortages. And we know at the moment they've particularly suffered last year with famine. But it wasn't the worst time. The worst time was 1942, which is still called the Time of Bones. Anyway, there they are, still there today. When the 170 survivors came, came through the surf and up onto the beach, they were picked up by uh, the Antandroi, who took them to their king. 
at a place called Fenerive. We don't know exactly where it is. The town has, has disappeared now. But there, the survivors somehow managed to escape. 170 of them, and as they went, they managed to grab the Antandroy king and two princes. And they escaped an incredible journey. They're wearing sea boots and European clothes, and they escape through the country and walk towards Fort Dauphin to try and escape, to try and get a, a ship back to England. And they get this far, to the Mandrari uh, River. And uh, they, as they try to cross it, the king's men, the king has been released by this stage, the king's men catch up with them and start chopping them down as they cross uh, into the water. I thought this would, might be as far as I would go with following in their footsteps, but no, my guide said, actually, the mandrar is quite shallow. So just take your trousers off and uh, in your pants, off you go across the river. So here I am. There was one slight anxious moment because I said, well, <laughs> what about the crocodiles, the Nile crocodiles that famously live in the Mandrari? And the guide said, well, they were villagers. And he said, well, don't worry too much about that because this time of year they live in the deep shallows. <laughs> they made for an uneasy wade through the river knowing that. But we made it like the survivors of the de Grave did to the dunes uh, opposite. And there, the Europeans were slaughtered. Of the 170 uh, survivors of the shipwreck, only three survived. Uh, one of them was James Benbow. Now, that's a name you will be vaguely familiar with, Treasure Island, the Admiral Benbow. Admiral Benbow was his father, who was a great sort of celebrity at the time, and James hoped to follow in his footsteps and was actually captain. Uh, of his own ship. But he managed to escape. He got to Fort Dauphin, one of the only people who did, and made it back to, to London, only to die at the age of 27. One of my little lockdown uh, expeditions was going to find his grave. And he's buried in St Nicholas's Church in Deptford. It's hard to find exactly where in the graveyard, but there's a plaque on the wall to James Benbow. So rather nice to, to tie in there. But there was another survivor, perhaps far more famous, and that is, of course, a name you would have heard of, Robert Drury. Robert Drury was only 15 at the time that he was captured by the King's men. He was spared because of his youth, and he would spend the next 16 years as a slave of first the Antandroy, until he escaped, and then he became a slave at Sakalava. And he managed eventually to escape, having been a soldier, having married, and having performed all sorts of roles within the Asakalav tribe. But he did manage to escape. Uh, his father sent a ship and a little message from Clapham saying, uh, you know, here I am. And amazingly, Robert Drury managed to find the ship, get on it, and got back to London. Back in London, Robert struggled a little bit. He'd been 16 years a slave in, in Madagascar, but he did find the, the odd job, and eventually he was forced back into the world of the sea and became a slaver. And he returned to Madagascar to pick up slaves. Can you imagine the, the surprise of the Antandroy and other tribes when a European turns up and not only speaks their language, but can throw a javelin like, like they could. They obviously found it a remarkable experience. Anyway, Robert Drury did come back to London. He lived very close to here in the end. He, he spent his last few days in a coffee house and eventually died, and his service was held at Clement Danes. And he was buried in Pauper's graveyard, very close to here, uh, in Clement Danes Pauper's yard, along with 100,000 other people. And uh, if you were to look for him today, you'd have to dig up the London School of Economics library because he's buried somewhere underneath uh, that. So there it is, Robert Drury. My next uh, encounter, if you like, or my next historical journey, takes me on the Majunga Tanner Road. Now this is Madagascar's first road, built in 1895. And it goes through the most beautiful countryside, the most beautiful golden savannas. 
It's 560 kilometers long, and to ride it, you take a taxi cruise. I did it twice, and it's about 18 hours uh, along the way. But the most, uh, the most beautiful uh, journey that I probably did in Madagascar. The, the road itself is, of course, the work of invaders, because it was the first road, and it was built by the French. You've got to remember, until 1895, Madagascar had done well holding out against uh, foreign invasion and so on. But when the uh, French arrived, they landed in some force in Majunga in January 1895. And the plan was to advance across the land to Tama, as I say, 560 kilometers away. And as they advanced, they had this idea that they would build a road and they would drag these great iron handcarts with them. Now, when the British general, Lord Roberts, heard about this plan, he said, it's madness. If you are a European and want to conquer tropical land, you have to move very fast. You have to move faster, fast in order that your army won't succumb to disease before you reach their objective. But the French said, no, no, this is the way we're going to do it. And so they set off with 18,000 men. First they landed here at the Point de Sable in uh, Majunga. And then they then set off with uh, a colonial army of about 15,000 soldiers, about half of them colonial troops, and uh, 7,000 porters. Uh, they were fortunate in that the colonial troops included a large number of Senegalese who were disease resistant and probably the best troops that they had. But anyway, off they go, and uh, it's a, a terrible journey from their point of view. I try, as it were, to retrace their steps. Uh, they succumb to disease, black water fever and malaria. I was a little bit anxious about following them because just before heading off for Madagascar, I talked to people here at one of these meetings and they said, well, actually, there's recent news that the Dahal bandits have been stopping minibuses on that road and they recently stopped a minibus and cut the hands off uh, some of the passengers on that minibus. So it was with that in mind that I had to contemplate uh, this journey. But I thought it through and... I realised that actually things had adapted slightly and minibuses were travelling in convoys and so on. And I decided, you know, go, let's go for it. So off we went. And of course, nothing untoward happened. But it was an anxious thought in the back of my mind. And what emerged was a beautiful journey across this savannah. For those of you that know this road, this is Andriba, which during the war was known as the Wall. Um, it was actually defended by uh, two of the Queen's generals, Queen Ranavalu, uh, called, um, sorry, one was a major, Major Graves, who was an ex-British officer who'd fought in the Zulu War, and there was Colonel Shervington. And they set up fortifications on that hill, which would have been very successful, but the Malagasy troops were very inexperienced, they had they'd never been in combat before, and were really not ready for this. So eventually, Graves and Shervington fled. Again, during lockdown, I managed to track down Shervington, and he's buried in Brompton Cemetery. You can find his great big white tomb there, and it says Colonel Shervington, who served for the Queen of Madagascar in 1895. Actually, he and Graves both fled. They both made it back to England uh, incredibly. Anyway, at uh, my Vetanama, the this army paused. The, the toll on the French had been catastrophic. About half the army would die of disease, uh, well over 8,000 porters and soldiers. Only 25 Frenchmen were actually killed in combat during this campaign. The rest all died of disease. And at Maida Tanala, they set up uh, hospitals, a uh, huge hospital to cope with this, and there are still some traces of that hospital uh, today. But here the campaign halted, and uh, a little French gunboat managed to sail all the way up the Akopa River here and strafed the hills with its uh, gatling guns, but the marina artillery was 
put on a, a high vantage point of red rock. It wasn't difficult to find. It's now called the Pylons. And I knew, or I had a good idea, that this is where uh, I would find their positions. And in the end, the, the French came off the river and sent legionnaires up there. And on the 9th of June, 1895, that's when the battle unfolded. And I wondered whether I'd got the right place. But as I climbed, I came across uh, this, which I feel fairly sure is a human bone. It's either an ulna or a radius, a little coin there uh, for size. It may be from that period, who, who knows. Far more uh, telling, however, was this pottery. And the pottery includes uh, this belt buckle there as well, which I found on top of the, uh, the pylons, this hill. And what was a particular giveaway was that one of the pieces of pottery was clearly made by Jean Laborde. It had that very distinctive Jean Laborde pattern on it made in, uh, in Mansoa, the industrial complex of the Queen. And so I knew that I had found the place where the Marina artillery had been positioned. And it's one of those great moments in this journey for me. I'd spent three years researching uh, the history of Madagascar, and then to get to a place and scratch the surface, and there this history all comes up to light, was, as you can imagine, a rewarding moment. My third episode, if you like, or, or, or bit of history, takes us much further north, but only a few years later. And it's, it takes us to a little bay called Russian Bay, opposite uh, Nusi Bay, right up in the northeast of the, or northwest of the country. And this story, in some ways, has very little to do with Madagascar. And in other ways, Madagascar changed the course of world history, or at least contributed to that change as a result of what happened there. It also has a topical theme, because it involves the, uh, a visit from the Russians. And the story here is that, as many of you will know, in 1904, the Imperial Japanese forces had laid siege to Port Arthur in China, and had been very successful. The Tsar decided, Tsar Nicholas II, decided that he would send an enormous fleet to relieve Port Arthur. The only trouble with this is, was distance. The fleet would have to either go through the Suez Canal or all the way around Africa. They'd have to refuel that at some stage. And it was a journey that everybody said, you cannot do. You cannot travel 18,000 miles and fight a battle against the Japanese. The received wisdom at the time is that if you were going to get involved in a major naval conflict, you should only be 2,000 miles from your nearest base. And they were nine times that. The other problem for the, for the Russians is that their, their fleet was disastrous. It was known as the Second Pacific Squadron. And in gunnery training in St. Petersburg, they didn't hit a single target before leaving, and some of their ships ran aground. They then set off through the North Sea, heading off for... Uh, the African coast and, and the long journey ahead. And in the North Sea, they encounter a, a small fleet of British trawlers from Hull. And they think that they're Japanese torpedo boats. So they open fire. And they open fire with everything they've got. This ship near the Oriole um, fired 100 rounds and didn't hit a single thing. The ship over here is called the Aurora. And the Aurora was hit six times by friendly fire uh, and the killing the chaplain and, and uh, doing severe damage to the ship. Amazingly, the Aurora survived all of this and is now uh, still there in St. Petersburg as a tourist attraction. Meanwhile, the whole fleet is, a squadron rather, is uh, commanded by this uh, guy, Mad Dog Rosehestvensky, Rose I think you pronounce it, who was a very tempered, intemperate man, given to uh, walloping his junior officers if they displeased him. But he did know that this was going to be a disaster, and he sent constant messages to the Tsar pleading 
for the expedition to be abandoned. Anyway, they, the Russians do reach uh, Madagascar, uh, some coming down the coast of Africa, some, half the fleet going through the Suez Canal. And 47 ships, Russian ships, assemble here in Russian Bay. All European powers wanted nothing to do with the Russians. The Portuguese wouldn't let them in Angola. The British wouldn't let them in, in South Africa. But the French would let them land in Madagascar. Remember, the French had been in power for 10 years by this stage. The French would let them land here, but they wouldn't let them come to Diego Suarez because they didn't want all those 47 Russian ships in the port. So they said, well, you can go to Russian Bay and you can hole up there. So the Russians went there and they waited. They waited for the coaling ships to, to catch up. They waited for their supplies, and their supplies included fur boots, which were much good in Madagascar. The, the, the sailors there sent mail home, and off it went, and a month later they got their mail back, only discovered it was their own letters which were being returned to them. So pretty soon the sailors in this fleet and uh, all the personnel involved started to go a little bit mad. Some of the officers go into Hellville and they end up playing cards with the locals, buying a lot of opium and a lot of alcohol, until eventually the French authorities had said, this has to stop, and nobody else was allowed into Hellville, which is about 10 kilometres away. So they're confined here, and a lot commit suicide, this madness seeps through the fleet, they do gunnery training and are as useless as ever, and they also start collecting animals to bring on board the ships. And they collect these black lemurs, which are still there in Russian Bay today. They think they're monkeys. And there's lots of descriptions of uh, monkeys on board the ship. The ships, meanwhile, have all the decks packed with coal. So all the men on board walk around bare feet, all the sailors barefoot, covered in black dust. And as I say, uh, the conditions were appalling. But something else happened in Russian Bay, and that is because they're there for two months, this tropical weed starts to grow around the hulls of the ship, slowing them down. And that's going to be very important in the battle to come. So what happens then is that in March, after 10 weeks, in March 2005, the Russian fleet set sail. I think we know what happens next. They, they sail uh, several thousand miles to the north until they reach that little strait between Korea and Japan. And there, they meet the Japanese fleet with disastrous consequences. 5,000 Russian souls are lost. The Japanese lose only 116 men. Half the Russian fleet is destroyed. And this will change the balance of power around the world. For the first time, a great European power has been defeated by an emerging nation. So the world is going to look very different from this moment on. And I like to think that Madagascar had a role in that with these ships that were just too slow uh, for the action, were easily picked off by the Japanese uh, torpedoes. The Russians also had uh, another effect on Madagascar, perhaps less, and that is the mutineers. Several of the uh, mutineers, we don't know how many, were simply put on shore and told to take their chances in Madagascar. And they did. Uh, they married. They had children. This is one of the survivors' graves. It's said the last of the Russian sailors died in 1936. Uh, one uh, person in Nusi Bay in Hellville told me, uh, we're all a bit Russian here, which is a lovely idea, not entirely true perhaps. Only one ship made it back to Madagascar on the way back, a British-built merchant ship, and it pulled it into Diego Suarez this time. These Troops, soldiers, sailors rather, look surprisingly white and clean given what they've been through. The Aurora, meanwhile, managed to escape uh, to the Philippines where it was interned by the Americans and lived to fight another day. And as I say, it's still there in St. Petersburg today. So there it is, Madagascar and the Russians and the influence they had on each other, even if only peripherally. My last encounter is more personal in a sense and it takes us back to Tanner and, uh, and into the present. And it starts with a demonstration on the 18th of April uh, 2018. And the, 
government had said they didn't want anybody to turn up for this demonstration downtown. I, I went down there early in the morning and was turned back by the army. But people in town were angry. They were angry because the government, Harry's government, had said that, had, had made this decree, you may remember it, insisting that um, if you were to stand in the election of 2018, you had to be uh, at least 45, and that's a wipe out one opponent, Angelina, uh, or uh, you had to have been resident for the last nine months, and that was to wipe out Ravel Amarna. And, 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 and as you would imagine, people in Tana, with some justification, were angry about that. They also had conflicting instructions, because the mayor of Tanner said, yeah, you can demonstrate. And so we were always set for a difficult morning. It was tempting to leave town. A lot of my friends did, because they knew there was going to be trouble. But actually, other Malagasy friends of mine said, no, you must stay. You must see what happens and go back and tell people. And so I did. And I joined the... Um, the merchants, the travelling merchants, are up on the up on the hill above town. They were there selling their Bibles and fags, and we we sat there and, and waited to see what would happen. And it was a surreal scene below us because a, a sort of medieval battle soon began to unfold with a soundtrack from Frozen, which was being played very loud over loudspeakers. And then, at the height of the sort of conflict and fighting, you'd hear English church bells from the churches around on the hill. And of course the, the, the merchants, the street merchants, knew all the sounds of the different gunfire. They'd go, oh, that's, that's tear gas. And you could hear these, you'd see these wisps of tear gas going over the lower part of the town. And then they'd go, oh, birdshot. And then, oh, live rounds. And, and then you would hear this clatter of machine gun. Now, of course, I've never heard machine gun fire before, yet alone used against human beings. And in fact, three people were killed that day and countless injured. So it was, a, a, as you can imagine, a difficult day. And I surprised myself by, by, by wanting to know more. And when the shooting stopped, the army pulled out and everything suddenly went very quiet. And I decided that I would descend the steps to see what was happening. And there was a moment it, when the streets below were completely empty. The army and the police had pulled out and, and there was nobody there. But then gradually a few people began to, to appear. You can see the rocks left over. And there was little oily fires of burning tyres. And they'd use skips as well as, as a kind of tank which they pushed in front of them. But then suddenly... The, the full demonstration appeared from round the corner. And they came marching down here towards the town hall, and I was swept up amongst them. The only white face amongst this very jubilant, very nervous crowd. I mean, when a, a, a motorbike backfired, everybody just fled into the side streets, and then we all came back and crept back again, and we carried on our march. And it, it sounds odd, but it, it's the nearest thing I can imagine to being a sort of extra in Les Miserables. You're, you're in this, in, in this very excited demonstration, all marching on. And it's not really for me to say who was right and who was wrong that day. But I did feel that the people of Tana and these demonstrators did have a point. Anyway, the next day, calm was restored. The army returned to town and uh, filled up the uh, Independent Square with their personnel. And hymns were played over the loudspeaker. The bodies of the dead were brought to the town hall and laid out on sort of beds or plinths there. And I was told that the government uh, was paying for, for all of this, this, this great funeral. When I asked why, uh, one of my friends said, well, because when you've killed someone, your government, you have to observe the funerary rites. Because if you don't, it's like killing them all over again. And that, that, that mixture of humanity and passion sort of typified of that day. And I've often reflected on, on what I saw. Madagascar is, to outsiders like me, endlessly perplexing. Uh, 
I, I, I sometimes felt that the, the, the more I knew about the country, the less I understood. Madagascar seem, Malagasy seemed so sort of stubbornly happy and, and, and they never seemed to talk about the things that they lacked. We're not defined by what we don't have, people would tell me. The passion and humanity uh, of that day was, like so much in Madagascar, mystifying. There was so much I realised that I, I didn't understand. The veneration of the dead, the power of the ancestors, all things really difficult for Europeans to, to compass. And for outsiders in this history, there are puzzles everywhere. Why is Sakalava art decorated uh, with these erotic sculptures? All, European anthropologists come up with all sorts of theories about this, about the connection between um, reincarnation and procreation and so on. When I asked Sakalava about it, they said, no, we just like sex. So it's very difficult to, to understand some of these features. History, too, is an enigma for, for, for many of us. When did the continental Africans arrive in Madagascar? When did the Asian Malagasies arrive in Malagasy? When? How? Why? These are questions we just don't really know the answer to. What became of the elephant bird? Did it die of a virus? Or was it human predation or loss of habitat? It was enormous. If you go to the south coast, all through the dunes, and places like Belica, the, the place where I landed with the, the, the Degrave, all through those dunes, they're scattered with elephant bird uh, shells. Queen Rana Balloon, was she, was she the tyrant, a genocidal tyrant, and she's often depicted at, or is she a victim of a, a, a Christian rewriting of history? I don't have answers to any of these, and perhaps that's, that's no bad thing. We should perhaps rejoice more in the mysteries of our world. So, thank you for um, joining me on this little historical journey, or four little historical journeys. I hope you enjoy this country and your next trip as much as I have doing this. Madagascar may be enigmatic, but there's probably no better place in the world to be happily lost. Thank you.